and also here. Okay, now the meeting is recorded. So this is our uh, user meeting number 10. And uh, in fact, uh, during the last nine meetings, we walked through quite a lot of topics, looking at many aspects of the platform uh, from the basics to some really advanced features. So during the time between the meetings, uh, we developed a lot on a number of uh, domains, uh, which are represented in our data grok packages on our public repository. And uh, we would like to share some of these developments with you. Uh, and today uh, we have a number of topics to highlight. The first part will be devoted to Cam Informatics development. Uh, and this part I'm gonna present. Uh, then uh, Vadim will uh, take on the topic of uh, biosignals package development. Uh, Alexander will uh, highlight some of the uh, new uh, features in uh, data grok functionality and UI. And if the time allows, we will delve into uh, various topics and maybe touch some points of the further data growth development. And the progress we've made is not limited to these topics. However, that's what we want to talk about today. So from here, let me start with the CAM informatics part. And actually looking at the um, list of users, I anticipate that not exactly all of you uh, have seen the uh, CAM informatics functionality presentation. That's why I would like to start with the overview of that area and then dive into the uh, recent developments uh, and highlight some uh, future prospects. So now let me switch to my data grok instance. I will be using the dev instance there since it ships the uh, latest updates. Uh, so please, uh, Anatoly, uh, help me uh, confirm uh, whether you see my uh, screen with data grok. Absolutely, yes, I can see it. Very good, thank you. Uh, so let me start with uh, uh, opening a simple file with some uh, small molecules data. Uh, and there are actually a number of ways to do this in data grok. One way is to just take this CSV file with some smiles in it and drag it into the platform, right into the UI and get it opened. But there are other interesting places in data grok I recommend you to look at. And one of these is here in our demo files data set. Uh, there are some extracts from the Campbell database that I will be using through that presentation. And for that reason, I will switch to using the demo files instead of the uh, desktop files. So um, let's proceed directly to the smiles file, which is just a random subset of the Camel database entrances. And right in here, you can see the molecule renders uh, produced by the uh, well-known library called Ardikit. Ardikit is a really deeply developed library for very many aspects of chem informatics, including uh, fingerprint computation, uh, substructure search, uh, fingerprint computation for similarity search, etc. cetera. And uh, what I want to highlight in here is that now we do support several renders for molecules uh, as well as for processing molecules. In this example, uh, Ardikit is used. However, it's possible to switch uh, the molecule rendering to uh, OpenCam Leap, uh, which was used recently and which you might have seen in one of the previous presentations, uh, one of the previous user meetings. So you can see here that the uh, textual value uh, which you can see here is uh, converted into a render. 
So now let's proceed to uh, navigating through the uh, property panel on the right side. Uh, when you select the molecule, you can see a number of uh, information panels or info panels, what we call it. And just by going through some of them, you can see that uh, it provides for some basic information and some more advanced stuff like uh, 3D rendering of the molecule. Here you can see that it's actually in 3D, it's not just a flat molecule. There is an info panel for toxicity prediction, drug likeness. Uh, there is also a panel that uh, accesses the Campbell database and compares the selected molecule with the database entrance. Uh, and by clicking through these panels, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, this list can be easily expanded. Uh, this can be done either by the user installing a new package or by the system administrator providing new package for you. And these are the data group developers who build on top of data group platform uh, so that the functionality uh, that contains uh, uh, is contained in the info panel will be shipped along other uh, features in the data grok package. So uh, these panels actually work transparently. Uh, I'll show you one example here. This is the gas partial charges visualization. And in fact, this is produced by a server side script, which I will briefly show you. So we just zoom in the font a little bit. So this is the uh, simple Python script that produces this render. And uh, the way DataGrok understands this is a panel is actually over here. We just say this script plays a role of a panel. And uh, there is an input and an output. And the output will contain graphics. And this Python script runs on the server with the given output. And uh, that is the uh, platform that uh, triggers display of this information panel. So that after the script is marked up with the panel tag and deployed to data group, it will appear uh, in the case of uh, a molecule. And in fact, the way we know this is a molecule is through its semantic type. The concept of semantic type is very important in data group. Uh, I'll just show you the common properties where I can see that it's indeed a molecule. The way it works here uh, is that uh, on the opening of that file, a detector in the chem informatics package was triggered and detected this, that this column is indeed a molecule. Uh, however, in the applications, you can assign the uh, semantic types, of course. So uh, this is how it works with the property panels. Uh, there is also uh, the search functionality. Uh, for instance, let's look at the similarity search feature. Um, so in this example, I will uh, click through the molecules and get the molecules uh, from that column similar to to the one I selected. And um, there is an important note that uh, in this case, now I actually um, using the uh, client side RDK based uh, similarity search. Whereas uh, in the previous versions of CAMP package, uh, we used the uh, server side RDK similarity search. And uh, that's the work that we've been going through over the last almost half a year, where we leveraged the power of uh, technology called WebAssembly. Um, WebAssembly is a technology to run the native code in the browser, uh, transpiled in a certain way. Uh, and in this scenario, we are using the client-side RDKit uh, actually, it's 
version that's not yet released. It's bleeding edge. However, it provides a lot of things we previously did with uh, service-side RDKit. Uh, the benefits are clear. Uh, we just uh, have less latency and uh, utilize the power of the user's computer. So it produces better scalability, uh, better latency, and in interactiveness of the platform in the end. So in this uh, piece of demo, I'll just go to the packages and show you what I mean by uh, the uh, um, type by, or by the, by the uh, render and uh, the choice between client side and, and, and uh, service side uh, RD kit I mentioned. I just find the camp package. And now in the packages, in its uh, properties, it's possible to introduce custom properties. For instance, here in the camp package, uh, I introduced one property that specifies the render being used. And in this selection, RD kit is used, which you could have seen. Uh, if I were to select OCL, uh, the renders of the molecules in the grid will be using the open cam lib. So uh, this is the example of similarity search. If I remove the package from the uh, instance, uh, the default server side RD kit search will be activated. Uh, the one that uses what we call compute virtual machine uh, to produce basically same results. Okay, so uh, let's proceed further. I'll uh, just check the time here. Uh, so uh, I would like to open another file to present the uh, R group analysis functionality. Uh, let me activate this dialog. And first for the R group analysis, I am to select the most common substructure first. And then I'm gonna produce uh, the um, R groups columns with the corresponding uh, trellis plot. So let's do that. Okay, so uh, what happened here is that the R groups column were added as a result of R group analysis and on the, in the middle of the screen, we can see the trellis plot, uh, which has this new feature, allows you to kind of focus on a certain part of the data set, either focus on the certain part or actually go to the whole data set. And that's what I did right now. Okay. Um, also what's important to, uh, Note here is that in the trellis plot, you can see the molecule renders uh, on the axis labels. And uh, this is not the only place where the uh, molecules will appear instead of the textual representation of the uh, molecules. And uh, this is part of the uh, work we did to support generic custom cell renders as part of the platform. Uh, so what I mean by the custom cell render is uh, basically a function that uh, produces a graphics out of some input format. It may be just raw string or any other format. And uh, based on the semantic type of the column, the custom cell render will be uh, triggered. Uh, and you can create your own custom cell renders in fact in one of the previous user meetings, uh, there was a presentation of a MapCam browser. And in that video, I think we could have seen the small and nice uh, plots as a cell uh, instead of uh, regular uh, data type. So you have this variety of choices really useful for your solutions development. And uh, let me just go through some of the other viewers that support these cell renders. For instance, let me visualize something on the scatter plot. Let me go for the smiles here. 
Yeah, so that's, uh, well, of course, there are more molecules, but the axes are labeled by the uh, renders here. And there are a few other viewers that support these cell renders. Uh, also, this now appears as part of the tooltips, uh, also part of the forms, etc. cetera. I'm not gonna show all of them to save time. However, uh, the support is now fully provided on the platform. Um, so maybe I can briefly show you this nice sketcher feature where I can just select or produce the molecule of an interest and look at all the uh, info panels that pertain to this molecule in the sketcher. It's also quite a nice feature sometimes. So that's a brief overview of the uh, CAM package. There is more information on it available on our documentation uh, website and in our videos. Uh, all the links uh, are provided in the uh, presentation. Actually, I don't know if we share it or not, but there is also a website with our help here. And there is a overview of CAM informatics for developers and also the uh, overview of CAM functionality in general, which I highly recommend it to you uh, go through. Um, and uh, now let me take a pause and get some of your questions uh, on this presentation to later proceed with the new features of the package. So please, any questions so far? So uh, then maybe not a question from my side, but uh, in addition, we have uh, also recently implemented the ability to provide uh, custom sorting functions for any data type. And of course, this is also applicable to uh, molecules. So uh, now uh, as a JavaScript application developer, you can provide your uh, custom functions uh, that will be used for uh, sorting molecules on uh, axis in the spreadsheet and so on, which uh, could be uh, really handy. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, just as a hint here, uh, we have recently started to post uh, branched updates on uh, various data growth functionality uh, recently coming. And in this branch, in this uh, thread on our community forum, for instance, uh, you can read about custom compare function. And in the other uh, thread, uh, which is called CAM informatics updates. You could, of course, find how this is useful for uh, CAM informatics. So please join our community forum and get the latest updates on our developments. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, so far, we've seen the core functionality of uh, CAM. And now I would like to highlight some of the uh, new features, which are maybe uh, not generally used every day, but uh, they are very important in some applications. And uh, let me start from opening yet another file. So I'll go with the uh, uh, the scaffolds one, yeah. Um, so um, first of all, what I want to notice here is that now it's not only the smiles uh, format, which is of course used a lot, but uh, there are more formats that RDKit support, and that's now brought fully to the client. Therefore, it's very easy to open this CSV files with multi-line entrances in the mold block format. And that's what I did right now. So here, I would like to show some functionality related to scaffold. In this uh, column called scaffold, we can see the uh, 
scaffolds that we want to align smiles column to. And uh, the way to work with that is to mm -hmm. click on the column. And in here, the RDK settings panel will appear. Um, may I just ask uh, one of you to mute your microphone? I think there is some background noise. Yeah, this one. This is a dog, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so please, uh, if you could try to mute, um, it would be very, very nice. Thank you. Uh, and let me proceed. So here I would select the column with the scaffold to see that the smiles column is now aligned to that scaffold. And of course, since uh, this column is supposed to be a sort of visual orientation for the uh, column being aligned. It is in a mode block format here, uh, or uh, it's any format that uh, provides four coordinates. Uh, and what's more, it's now possible to uh, highlight the scaffold uh, in, that, in that column. Uh, there is also an option called regenerate coordinates uh, this is used uh, in case when the uh, coordinates provided for the scaffolds are not high quality uh, or if they are not RDK native. In this case, if you try to align to them, uh, it will distort the render. To alleviate that, uh, you can resort to regenerate chords option. Mm, okay, so uh, let me go back to smiles table and uh, show the other um, small but nice feature related to uh, filtering. So uh, in any column in data grok, you can uh, basically filter things. However, we are now interested in the filter uh, that uh, is related to the column, uh, actually uh, to the molecule column. Actually, to just make it uh, make it a more kind of clear experiment, I will just go with the empty state and hit on the Control F keystroke here to activate the filter for the canonical smiles column only. And uh, this should be quite familiar to many of you. Basically, you can just. Um, you know, filter based on the scaffold. And again, there is an important difference uh, with the action I show right now, the client side RDK is used so that the index on that column is built to provide for this substructure search and filter based on the results of substructure search. Uh, and after the index has been built once, it's going to be reused. So the result is actually instant. And it will be reused for other molecules, uh, scaffolds of interest. Uh, however, uh, this is not the only thing I wanted to mention. Uh, the new feature that has to do with uh, uh, those, uh, those columns that contain just a few values in it. And uh, I believe we could use this our group column just produced previously. Uh, so here, uh, the dynamic filter type is selected for this column by default. Uh, I'll first show you the categorical option instead. So now if the categorical option is chosen for this column, try click here, instead of the sketcher, uh, I'm gonna have just the molecules as categories instead. And we have how many few of them, less than 10. And I can use this as a regular filter based on these categories. Uh, that's, uh, that's very useful. So uh, for the column now, I can select either I always want to have categorical filtering or always sketching. But the default uh, is a reasonable selection. Uh, where for the columns with less than 20 categories, it will activate the categorical filter 
And for those uh, that have more than 20, it will activate the sketcher filter. And for this one, the default resorts to the categorical one. Mm, okay, so I think that's about it for CAM informatics. I'll take a pause here to get some of your questions, please. Let me know if you want to dig into some particular topic around CAM informatics. Uh, then not a question, but uh, could you please take a look at the waiting room uh, uh, in Zoom? Oh, thank Maybe. you, thank you. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a good <laughs> suggestion. So let me go through um, and uh, I have the participants list in here uh, that maybe I can just stop share. And... Huh, interestingly, do you know uh, where is the meeting room in Zoom? Uh, I have a list of participants, but I don't seem to find the meeting room and no one knocked in. So maybe there is no one in the meeting room. Okay, maybe there is no one, but last time it was present. Maybe mm. it depends on uh, oh. meeting settings. Okay, the meeting was actually uh, not enabled with the waiting room. Now I clicked enable waiting room, but it was not that before. So now we have a waiting room. Let's see if anyone comes in. Okay, thanks. Just in case if someone joins join us later. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, let me take the last piece of that presentation uh, where I would like to describe some of the ways forward with CAM package. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Paolo Tosca, who is a co-developer of RDKit. Uh, he produces prompt updates to the RDKit Vasm uh, WebAssembly library, uh, contributing to our CAM package with some small fixes. Uh, so uh, right now uh, we are pushing the limits of what can be done with the uh, WebAssembly technology on the client side. And yet we worked a lot on the performance uh, of using the client side RDKit, uh, which can be noticed, for instance, when you scroll the molecules. Uh, and if you just try to, to do that, uh, you will notice that it's really smooth. And uh, previously with uh, OpenCamLib, uh, the scrolling time was not really a serious uh, area uh, since it was uh, reasonably fast. But the problem with OpenCamLib is that it doesn't support all the formats and not all the functionality that RDKit ships. Uh, therefore, RDKit. And uh, we actually implemented a number of design decisions in the CAM package with caching the molecules that are constructed by RDKit in memory, also caching the renders that the uh, RDKit instance produces. Um, but when it comes to alignment to scaffolds, uh, there is still something we have to work on to make the scrolling smoother than it is now. Well, right now it's acceptable scrolling time, but it can be better. And that's one of the things uh, we would like to work on, basically improve the overall uh, performance and reduce the latencies with uh, using CAM functionality. Uh, another direction uh, is to uh, provide for integrations with uh, CAM informatics related uh, machine learning models. Uh, now we are uh, taking initiative with uh, integration of data grok with machine learning clusters where these models uh, are usually deployed and this will open the uh, whole new range of uh, abilities to augment your data sets uh, with predicted information uh, so with that being said uh, we are going to continue moving the uh, whole RDKit functionality, sorry, whole pack, CAM package functionality uh, from our core to the package. And the package I'm referring to uh, is our uh, 
CAM package in the public data group website. And not all the uh, CAM related functionality is there right now. So it will take some time to move it all to here. And the benefit is clear. We will have uh, more abilities to do faster changes related to your feedback as users. And we'll get more contributors from our partner organizations. And to make it open source, uh, it may be uh, reused, find useful by someone else. Um, okay. So now let me just give me a second, I'll switch over back again and share the presentation. So, yeah. oh, sorry, here we go. Okay, so if there are not any more questions on CAM informatics, let us move forward to the biosignals topic. And I would like to uh, give the control to Vadim. Sure, great. Uh, uh, Dmitry Rasokhin entered the waiting room. Okay, that's good. Uh, one person in. I'll stop sharing my screen. And mm -hmm. uh, Vadim, I will uh, make you a host. Host disable participant screen sharing. I can't uh, share. Um, I'll make you a host. So, hey guys. Uh, uh, hi, Dmitry. Uh, yeah, unfor unfortunately, those meetings collide with our scheduled Friday meetings. Um, I only have about 20 minutes <laughs> before I have to rejoin. Mm -hmm. Anyway, good to see you here. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, good day, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vadim. I am a data scientist at uh, DataGrog. And today I will present you uh, by signals package. Uh, so in recent years, uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, devices uh, which tracks uh, various uh, biosignals like ECG, uh, EMG, etc. And it is uh, necessary to develop algorithms for uh, biosignal uh, processing as fast as possible and uh, uh, to be able to uh, to deploy them uh, in production. And uh, today we have many uh, whole uh, area of interest from uh, from various co various companies like Apple, et cetera. And uh, each company um, mostly focuses on one signal, but there are certain exceptions in uh, this rule. But, uh, but you can see that, uh, that each signal has uh, has its own companies uh, which are main in this uh, sphere, from uh, from electroencephalogram to electrocardiogram to PPG, uh, etc. There are some uh, some devices uh, some devices uh, uh, which uh, tracks uh, as signals uh, as a uh, soul. Uh, modular device, but there are also clothing, belt, uh, etc. And uh, like um, today, I will mostly present uh, possibilities of biosignal package on the example of ECG signal. ECG signal is a uh, electrical uh, electrical uh, signal of the heart, um, and uh, it usually like heartbeat on ECG signal usually looks like this. This is uh, like more a real world signal, but the problem with, uh, uh, with almost all signals in real world is that uh, they, mm, uh, they usually uh, looks uh, like this. Like, uh, there is a lot of noise on the signals and uh, it is uh, crucial uh, to filter out this noise and to detect, um, detect uh, noisy parts and clean parts and uh, to be able uh, to to, to do it very fast and um, convenient, yeah, and uh, that is um, and 
to uh, do these uh, operations. There are many uh, methods available at academic literature uh, and uh, and you need to test all of them to find uh, an optimal solution for your particular signal from particular device uh, and uh, several parameters and usually um, it is necessary to have uh, uh, to be familiar with with concepts of digital signal processing with concept of biomedical signal analysis uh, to to test uh, these methods uh, fast, and uh, it's very uh, it's very hard for a stranger in this uh, to make some progress in this field. Uh, so that is why we decided to develop uh, biosignals packages so that uh, uh, anyone with uh, some basic familiarity uh, with uh, concept of what signal is what. Uh, um, frequency domain is, time domain is, uh, like this person can uh, make uh, some analysis very fast and uh, without diving into this, uh, into this topic. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the features of biosignals package, uh, package is uh, interactive visual, visualization. I will show it uh, uh, in uh, how it works. Uh, lately uh, but here is an example of uh, uh, of signal uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, here's an example. that was pretty strong signal that was a very strong signal indeed <laughs> yeah it was a really strong signal <laughs> uh yeah uh, unfortunately we can't process it in this package uh, so let's move on uh yes and um uh, this is uh, this is an example of uh, representation of uh, uh, electroencephalogram uh, like uh, subset, and um, in this signal uh, in, in this package we will focus not only on general purpose uh, filters and methods, but also domain specific uh, to enable researchers from various fields uh, to. Um, to dive into using this package and uh, to make results as fast as possible. Uh, so the, the second crucial feature of this package is to uh, provide um, a way to, um, to um, work with uh, signal fusion uh, in which signal, uh, signals have uh, different sampling frequency, time shifts, Etc. So that researcher can uh, import all these channels from various uh, parts of body and uh, and uh, to align them on same time scale uh, and to uh, make work as fast as possible. Uh, yeah. And uh, on uh, screen uh, on the picture on the, uh, to to the left, you can see example of uh, of such. Uh, uh, device placements and and uh, and signals uh, from them. Uh, today we already have some methods uh, that are written in WebAssembly. They are uh, very fast, uh, uh, but also you can. Uh, I will uh, show you that you can also add your own custom scripts and use them in package as well. Uh, but we uh, realized that to work with uh, uh, with very uh, long signals like recordings may uh, be like uh, for 24 hour it is crucial to uh, to be uh, it is crucial for this method to be as fast as, as possible yeah uh, and uh, also uh, these methods should be um, suggested according to signal type, like uh, uh, specific for a certain type of signal. For ECG signal, it, it can be some methods to calculate heart rate variability. Uh, for uh, EEG signal, it can be uh, methods to uh, calculate uh, alpha uh, and other uh, spectral components of uh, signal. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
Vadim, I'm terribly sorry. Could you please let uh, some people in from the meeting room, from the waiting room? Because you are the host now. <laughs> okay. And, uh, how can I do it? Uh, I think there should be a button somewhere. Waiting room. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, admit. Mm -hmm. Dmitry has joined. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I will proceed. Uh, I will proceed. Uh, so, yes. And now let's, uh, let's uh, sh show uh, how it works. Uh, let's show how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, here is uh, an uh, e example uh, of, uh, uh, of OpenNet uh, Biosignals app. You can find it by uh, just opening it uh, in app uh, tab. The first uh, stage is to choose uh, uh, data uh, Fusionet database you want to work uh, with. Like let's say it's uh, ECGI database, then you choose a uh, record you want to work with, uh, and then it uh, it is loaded from uh, the website. And here and voila, we can see uh, this thirty seconds of electrocardiogram with. Uh, with annotations, like yes, uh, usually it is quite crucial to annotate signal uh, before working with it because algorithms usually have er er errors. Yeah, and uh, you can uh, add events to um, to this uh, chart just by clicking on it. Uh, later, I will add possibility to annotate not only points but. Uh, uh, ranges of signal, like uh, the first part is uh, is uh, 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 re recorded when patient was running, etc. Yeah, and um, let's process this signal. Uh, the first stage is usually uh, it's quite noisy, uh, as you see, and uh, it may be useful to apply some moving average filter. Uh, we have sampling, fre sampling frequency of uh, 500 hertz, so let's uh, let's say um, make window length 31, and we can see uh, that it, it it is smooth now, and it's it's much more um, it's mu much more convenient to detect uh, uh, characteristic points on this signal. Then uh, let's. Uh, uh, let's normalize it, uh, uh, like uh, apply max mean normalization to make it uh, on range from zero to one, uh, so that it will be more convenient to detect uh, our peaks. You can see, uh, and then let's um, let's uh, uh, get uh, our, our intervals from this signal. Uh, like uh, here you can see uh, our, our intervals yeah, it's like um, uh, time between con consecutive uh, heartbeats you can see how it changes over time uh, and uh, uh, and in the future I will I will add possibility to remove some outliers in this uh, signal uh, and uh, the final point of this analysis uh, is uh, to compute uh, uh, heart rate for variability uh, indicators. You, you can see that uh, we uh, computed uh, only two values for these 30 seconds because uh, we set at window width as 10 seconds and a step as five. Uh, so it's pretty reasonable. And uh, also we can compute uh, frequency domain uh, indicators and nonlinear domain indicators. Uh, like um, they are used uh, in um, monitoring of uh, uh, physiological state of uh, patients yeah uh, so okay um, this uh, this case uh, works well for 30 uh, seconds uh, of ECG signals but what about uh, what about like uh, more uh, <laughs> uh, more prolonged recordings uh, you can see that this uh, package works well uh, on uh, 30 minutes uh, with recordings of uh, 30 minutes duration and uh, you can slide over make zoom 
and uh, it is pretty interactive and uh, work very fast for this uh, for this uh, duration and this precision of uh, of samples uh, yes and uh, you can see that i already made uh, the same uh, the same operations for uh, for this um, database uh, and uh, you can see that sometimes algorithms uh, gives an errors and it is uh, necessary to correct mistakes of algorithms on different stages of uh, processing pipeline and as a result you can see uh, this line chart of a, a heart rate var variability uh, indicators over time over this uh, 30 uh, minutes yes uh, you can see uh, in which time uh, was several events, etc. And um, uh, this uh, package um, enables you to work uh, with uh, recordings from uh, Physionet. What is Physionet? Physionet is an uh, uh, is a website uh, with uh, uh, with databases with complex physiological signals, not, not uh, only uh, databases, but also software to, uh, to work with these uh, databases and also challenges, which is uh, regular, uh, and they, they make some uh, competitions with rankings and etc. And uh, usually it's necessary to have a certain level of programming proficiency uh, to download this data, to um, to get some useful information from it, and etc. And like um, our package, um, and uh, this package, which enables you to work with uh, this database, uh, the database is call, uh, calls uh, WFDB. It stands, it, uh, stands for uh, um, Waveforms uh, data, Waveforms database. Uh, yeah, package. And it uh, has some uh, extensive documentation of method, how, how to record them, uh, how to download them, how to work with them. Uh, and usually researchers uh, don't have time to, uh, to read all, all of this text. And uh, it, it's quite crucial for them just to, uh, just to drag and drop file and to get results. And um, how, this uh, how this, this file stored in database basically uh, there is uh, uh, to store one uh, recording it is necessary save three files, extension of dot dat uh, which contains a binary representation of digitized samples uh, uh, with extension dot hea uh, with um, uh, basic description of content like which lead of ECG signal, uh, how many bits uh, are encoded, uh, are um, allocated to encode one sample, etc. And uh, dot ATR, which is annotation of ECG signal, like uh, the second of uh, uh, number of second of arrhythmia start at uh, and end of arrhythmia, and uh, at which indices uh, our peaks of ECG signal is uh, located and etc and uh, to be able to open this file you need really to install this uh, wfdb package and uh, to uh, choose uh, which one database you want to work with and recording in this database and uh, in this uh, using this package uh, you can um, you can just uh, just open files uh, and uh, click on file you want to view uh, and voila we have this signal uh, to to view you can uh, also uh, load several other uh, files and you can see them you can uh, see what what do they look like and to choose uh, with which waveform of signal you want to uh, work to test your algorithms so it's pretty uh, straightforward simple and can uh, uh, and can um, give you more time 
for another uh, work. Yeah. Uh, yes, and um, and also it's not only uh, important. To, uh, it's not only important to uh, to work with uh, um, different uh, formats, but also to define a uh, to define a, a pipelines and to apply them to all files in folder. Um, it's uh, like the, the most common situation when a researcher have uh, had collected uh, data from uh, from uh, from many patients and he uh, have all this information sorted in uh, folders and it is necessary to define uh, testing pipeline in uh, in a way that I showed you uh, previously like this like you, you can uh, uh, play with parameters. You can play with uh, um, with several cases, uh, and uh, you want to uh, be able to apply uh, the plan to all files in uh, your folder. Yeah. Uh, and uh, today uh, you can do this in this way, but uh, later uh, we will uh, we will make it this way in a more usual way. Uh, that you can uh, add uh, some elements of pipeline, uh, enter some parameters here, uh, see uh, uh, result of this step, uh, change uh, parameters, and uh, in this iterative process, you will uh, reach some level of uh, excellence of analysis. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's about pipeline. Also. Uh, as you can see, uh, we already have uh, a broad range of uh, available filters. Uh, but if you, um, let's say you want to apply some, uh, some specific, specific uh, filter to your pipeline, uh, you can uh, go to scripts, uh, new Python scripts, and add uh, your own, uh, your own sc uh, script and immediately use it in BiSignals package. All you need to do is just to set a filter tag and we'll get this script and you can choose it and apply it. To demonstrate how it works, let's copy past normalize script and rename it, to, let's say, let's say presentation normalize just to just to show you uh, how it works uh, presentation normalize yes save it uh, and then uh, go to application by signals mm, choose record wait until it will download and and here you can see uh, that it uh, it appeared in list of all available filters. Uh, so you can construct your own pipeline from uh, from your uh, own scripts, and uh, yeah, and you will be able to share uh, this pipeline uh, with other researchers uh, to uh, to make communication and cooperation more. Um, more uh, more rapid yes uh, and also uh, together with uh, with all this functional I already showed you you can uh, you can also uh, see uh, see scripts that uh, ma that make works uh, for you like in this uh, script you you can see uh, how we read physionet annotations uh, and in this, um, using this script, you can uh, get names of all Pizonet databases available uh, to download. You can, uh, if you're interested in some particular database, you, you can, let's say, uh, copy uh, copy this uh, uh, copy this text and then paste it into another script uh, that can. Uh, that can return you list of all available uh, records in this database. Uh, later, I, I will add uh, possibility to choose 
uh, these uh, databases and records using uh, mouse click, but for now it's like this. Uh, yeah, you can see record lists of, of chosen database. Yeah, and uh, I think it's pretty much it. Uh, and thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Hello. Uh, thank you, Vadim, very good presentation. Uh, one more question. Uh, do you plan to add the function to load user file or uh, without PhysioNet? Uh, sure, uh, sure. I, uh, I will add uh, an dialog uh, which will enable you to, uh, to convert uh, signals from, uh, uh, from your files, like text files or CSV files uh, to assign uh, sampling frequency of the signal, uh, its type, and other parameters and to uh, work with it in uh, biosignals package. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's cool. Uh, can you also please elaborate on our plans for the uh, automated detection of the signal uh, and also for uh, the automatic uh, suggestions of different methods and information that could be extracted from it? Because mm -hmm. that's what yeah, data group is about. <laughs> sure, uh, sure. Uh, um, like uh, the detection of type of the signals uh, from uh, CSV and TXT file is already implemented. You can see that uh, uh, in the bottom of this tooltip uh, quality by signals ECG uh, that we, de we detect type of uh, this column of this signal from a name of, of column. Also, uh, I think that uh, uh, we we can detect uh, not only from name but also from waveform of si uh, of signal if it is necessary uh yes and uh, and uh, in the future um, i think we will add possibility to uh, apply certain scripts to column uh, just like uh, this that you will uh, make uh, uh, right mouse click and uh, to convert uh, to apply uh, these scripts uh, these scripts to uh, signal in the column and it will uh, it will be uh, added to the right to existing column and you can then uh, load this file or uh, or apply uh, some another methods to compute some indicator and to then uh, download uh, information that you uh, that you needed for yeah yeah thank you uh, I just wanted to clarify that the one of the angles uh, for that project is to be able to drag and drop pretty much any file that contains a biosensor signals and uh, automatically uh, extract uh, many relevant information out of it without even uh, having to launch this application. So imagine uh, simply clicking uh, on the uh, CSV or EDF or uh, that file uh, and uh, seeing in the side panel, uh, well, uh, the heart rate, uh, if it's uh, ECG or uh, the number of steps uh, or some uh, measures of uh, synchronicity, if it's uh, EEG. Uh, so something along uh, these lines. Um, Vadim, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's a really good one. Uh, it was interesting following this development uh, in the recent couple of months. It's really good pace. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, a small one about the annotations. Uh, so is there an algorithm that produces these annotations? Uh, it's not clear from the interface where these annotations come from. It seems like they can be produced automatically, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, actually, by default, uh, this particular case uh, is uh, uh, like this particular annotations, uh, they are taken from, uh, from file itself, from the record itself. Yeah, but uh, in the... In the uh, yeah, but in the future, I will uh, I will make separate annotation tool uh, in which uh, there will be prediction of algorithm, 
and all uh, the researcher uh, will need to do is o is only correct mistakes of algorithm. Mm. So uh, it will be more uh, uh, like less time consuming to uh, to add all these points, but uh, it will enable you only to correct uh, several mistakes. Yeah. Mm. Sounds good. And what are the libraries you're going to use for this uh, automated annotation markup? Uh, do you have a plan in mind? Uh, this uh, viewer I um, I wrote on uh, on uh, I forgot name of this library uh, eCharts. I wrote on eCharts, and I think that I will proceed uh, to use this library uh, to add uh, some radio buttons uh, to be able to annotate not only uh, our peaks, but also uh, bit classes, like uh, whether it's normal bit or extra systole or fusion bit or uh, other, other arrhythmias. All right, uh, that's what I've been thinking about. Uh, the part where you use e charts to help uh, users annotate uh, that's clear. I was thinking more about these different types of uh, annotations that can be automatically generated. I was oh. thinking uh, what was or what will be the library uh, you are you going to use for these annotations? I think, that, I think that I will use uh, standard methods of uh, WFDB because it, uh, it already has uh, processing uh, mm. uh, part uh, in which you can uh, Resample annotation indices, and also you can um, and also you can compute heart rate and find uh, peaks, and uh, and uh, and also detect uh, QRS complexes, uh, and uh, yeah, and other methods. I think that this uh, classic methods will be used uh, to 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 uh, assign this annotation, but. Uh, but I think it will be more convenient for users to uh, to be able to apply their own algorithms to assign initial uh, locations of annotation. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, uh, Vadim. And uh, just last note, uh, since we only have one minute for for that part to move over to the next one. So uh, I think it was uh, an interesting experience for you to use this DSP package for filtering. Uh, so the way the package is constructed now is that we have the signals package, which uses the other package uh, called uh, DSP. And this package has uh, generic uh, DSP functions built through WebAssembly. Uh, I don't know how much of the performance impact it was for you, Adim, um, but maybe you could say a couple words about this. Uh, to add uh, this, uh, yeah. uh, this function. Yes, was it... Uh, was it uh, changer for the performance? Yes, yes, it was, um, you can feel, um, you, you, you can feel it from a time of processing that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, functions written on web assemblies, they are much uh, more f uh, faster than, uh, than Python scripts. Yeah, you can, you, you, you can feel it very, uh, very, uh, like enormously. <laughs> Great, uh, Vadim, thank you. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, today there are more and more generic libraries out there that were uh, ported to WebAssembly. And now you can actually ship that ready-made uh, best of breed functionality to uh, the platform through WebAssembly. And that's what we are going to do with machine learning functionality, digital signal processing functionality, etc. Okay, Vadim, thank you. Uh, so then uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let's move forward to you, Alexander, and I'll ask Vadim to uh, uh, make him a host. Alexander, you are the host now. Alexander, oh, you uh, might yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, can you see my screen? Yeah, I finally managed. Where's the unmute button in the host mode? <laughs> Good. Uh, <thanks>. Okay. <laughs> can you see my screen? Yes. I think it's uh, yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
grow. Uh, and let me quickly check the meeting room and no one here, I guess. Okay, uh, what I'm going to show you today uh, is the um, data grok integration with user files. Uh, data grok actually supports uh, files loading by just dropping here, right? dropping here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I need to open a new one because it's so like that. Uh, I can just load any file from my local computer just by dragging and dropping in uh, inside the data grok. Uh, but uh, the problem is the most of the files are located in file shares or somewhere in the file storages. And uh, we developed a uh, file, file sharing browser based on file connections uh, to access all the files uh, users uh, actually have. Uh, to access the file uh, storage, you just need to create a new file share. Uh, we support now uh, Dropbox, uh, file shares, Windows shares, uh, Git, GitHub, special connector for GitHub. It's more efficient than just a Git. Uh, Google Cloud and S3. Uh, Amazon S3. Uh, so they are mostly uh, all uh, uh, connect, uh, connection types that uh, user users have. But of course, uh, you, uh, you, we and uh, you can always write a new connection. So uh, Datagrog supports a new connection uh, writing. You just need to make a pull request to our public repository to connect and uh, your connection will appear there. Uh, so user can create a connection and access the files that are uh, located in these folders. Uh, it's easy, for example, I can just double click on that file and load it. And uh, that's all. Uh, Data Grok uh, remembers the connection with uh, these files, uh, with the file, so uh, it knows that this table was loaded from the uh, connection, and you can always press uh, refresh and get a fresh copy of the data. Data Grok will reload it. And also, you can uh, share the data, but I will explain it later. Uh, now, I will show you a home folder. This is a folder uh, which all, uh, every user have. Uh, so you just need to go to the files and you will see it there. Uh, you can use it uh, as your personal file storage. Uh, so you can just take any file and drop it here. We will copy it there. Uh, usually it's located in the cloud storage like S3. Uh, that actually depends on uh, where data group is hosted right now. Uh, okay, and uh, you can use this uh, home folder uh, as a regular connection. You can open file from here and it will act just like a regular connection. You can refresh it anytime. Uh, and uh, there are actually a lot of uh, integration already with uh, third party application that, that can put uh, that can upload a file to Data Grok and uh, open it immediately. So you can uh, import uh, any data to Data Grok from, from your application. It's quite easy. Uh, you just need to some code work <laughs> and um, it would work. Uh, yeah, and uh, when you open the file, uh, you can share this data. So. Uh, you can share it like a data table. Uh, now it's uh, the Grok shares all that I opened uh, like a project. So I can share it as a data or I can turn on data synchronization. So uh, data will be reloaded when user opens the project. So if I open that project next time, uh, data Grok will automatically reload data using that uh, this function open file. Uh, note that uh, Data Grok automatically shares the home, adds the home uh, for home connection to the project uh, because this connection must be included to make this data sync work. Uh, this is the first option to share the uh, file as a data table, but uh, you can share a file. So if I pick uh, share a file, uh, there is the only option to share the connection home. Uh, that's because Data Grok, uh, as a most of the 
I don't know, oper <laughs> like an oper operating system, uh, can share files directly. So you can uh, create uh, a new folder and uh, share this folder. Let me show you how it works. Okay. Let's uh, try to share this demo G uh, CSV. Okay, there are two options. I can share directly my home folder. Uh, it's not recommended, but nevertheless, I can do it. So I can share, for example, with then uh, my home directory, and then we'll see everything that I have in my home directory. Or I can uh, create uh, a new connection for this test folder. So here is the path to this, con this connection, LXAPRM. Uh, that's my uh, home uh, namespace. And home test folder, that would be the name for a new connection that points to this test folder. Let's see how it works here. So if I want to share this accelerometer CSV, I can share the connection demo files, or I can create a new connection and it will be created in my, in my namespace. Uh, the namespaces are is a pretty powerful thing. Uh, we'll, I think we will explain them on further user meetings. Uh, it allows to uh, call each uh, entity directly by name. So all, all entities' names are, are unique and you can call them directly. Okay, uh, that's how uh, file sharing actually works. So you can put any files you want to your home directory or set up a new directory that points to uh, any location you want. And uh, by the way, uh, if you share this test folder or if you share any folder you want, uh, DataGrok won't show the uh, path to the parent connection. So a uh, user uh, will, uh, see this, uh, will see this directory with the files as an uh, as a root directory, so there is a good abstraction uh, on that. Uh, users actually don't see the full path to parent uh, folder. It is uh, useful to hide folder structure for those who uh, don't allow to see that. Alexander, okay. quick, quick question here. Um, can you can you quickly open the uh, the sharing connection dialog? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's not sharing the particular file; it's sharing the the whole folder. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, the, I, the, in, in some dialog, I, I thought I saw the CSV extension. Uh, yeah, uh, it actually. Uh, uh, let me explain how it works. Uh, mm -hmm. If you share the file, mm -hmm. uh, it shares the connection, but uh, you can uh, copy a hyperlink and use this hyperlink as a uh, hyperlink to the particular file. Uh, so uh, there are two points. Uh, you must uh, share a connection to make other users see it. And uh, you can share a hyperlink uh, to the particular file. Got it. Uh, so if you open the file, uh, you can see here that here is the uh, URI to this file. And this URI uh, can be copied and shared, and it uh, will point to well, the same data. Data, of course, if user if user have the access to uh, this connection. Uh, so, for example, if I just reload the page, I will get the same page. But if I send it to Anatoly, uh, he wouldn't see anything because he doesn't have the access to my home connection, unless I share it explicitly. So that uh, that that is basically how it works. So once you no. once you shared the connection the the, uh, the folder with me, you can send me links to particular files in this folder, and I will yes, be able yes, to open yes, it. Yes, 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 and you will see the particular so. file. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, very cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, by the way, uh, the other option to uh, to use it, so, uh, as Vadim said. Uh, there, uh, there are pipelines in DataGrok that uh, use the DataGrok uh, functions. So DataGrok, uh, as most of you uh, know, uh, has a function as a first class objects. Uh, there is a, some part of code that uh, accepts something and returns something. So there is an open file function then, uh, that accepts the full path. 
so uh, this function uh, really could be used uh, in any pipeline. It could be joined with other tables. Uh, it could be, I don't know, uh, reprocessed uh, if this file uh, refreshed uh, on the file share and so on. And many, many things could be done using this function concept. Um, any more questions? Okay, uh, that's actually how Datagrog supports uh, file shares and file storages. Uh, I say it again, we, uh, all, fire, uh, all file storages are generic for Datagrog, so uh, if you need to support some uh, other type of share, uh, you need just to uh, support a few methods uh, as write file, read file, write directory, and so on. Uh, and it will appear in this new file share dialog and you can connect to it. A question for you, Alexander. Um, if we have files in um, an Azure, uh, you know, in an Azure storage, you know, instead of having to load them here, is it possible straight out from your Azure, you know, home drive that gets set up in the company to, to do sharing as well? Uh, the worst case uh, is, uh, we need to uh, support Azure uh, directly. So we might want to support uh, Azure API. I almost sure uh, they have it. Uh, and uh, another uh, case, if uh, Azure can map it directly to Docker image file system, uh, we can access it uh, as a generic file system. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's, it's, it is mapped. Good. Yeah, uh, this demo files actually is a file system connector. So we just point to it uh, has a, a, a directory. So it is a file path inside the Docker container and a home folder is actually the same, but it has hidden directory, just not right. to show the user. Uh, yeah, sure, it's possible, of course. And I think we might want to uh, make a Azure connector. It's not so. It's not so hard. You just. We just need to implement a couple of methods to uh, access the file system. That's all. Okay. Thanks so much. Cool. Uh, more questions. Uh, okay. Uh, the next topic uh, I want to talk about uh, is uh, not. Uh, a user thing, but a more programmers thing. So uh, as you know, we have a JavaScript API, but uh, from now it's not JavaScript, but TypeScript. Uh, as you know, TypeScript is a language similar to JavaScript, but it's strongly typed. Uh, that actually helps a lot to uh, write, uh, write code. For example, if I write code, I automatically get the, all the all the IntelliSense types information, and I would know about uh, any errors and mistakes uh, before I load this. Uh, oh, you can see it mm, before uh, I start this code. Uh, so it's designed to uh, help uh, help the developer to write uh, uh, be beautiful code and uh, catch errors before <laughs> before deploying. And the, the Grok is now fully support TypeScript. Uh, more, uh, we have this JS Fiddler window with a lot of examples. And now it supports uh, IntelliSense. Uh, you just need to press Control and Space to get the IntelliSense uh, help. Uh, we will uh, improve that so it will uh, appear automatically. And uh, I think it will uh, in future support uh, TypeScript too. So uh, it will not only uh, understand the DG and Grok and our basic entry points, but even the variables or something like that. So uh, I don't think it will be available tomorrow or within a week, but uh, it's certainly a uh, thing that nice to have. And I think we have all the ability to make it. And uh, last thing I want to mention for today, now this uh, window supports uh, asynchronous code. So it supports await and async uh, keywords. 
and you can uh, easily operate with promises without using then and callbacks. Uh, that's basically everything I wanted to mention today. Uh, thank you for attention. If you have questions, I will gladly answer them. I have a question about a wait for a asyn asynchronous call. Mm -hmm. So uh, can we really do, use, I, I know that a wait is, cannot be used everywhere. So there are only certain contexts in JavaScript. Uh, yeah, right? so, yeah, that's the, that's the context. So you can use it. Here. So it's going to be called from the synchronous. Yeah. So it's not, it's not it's not going to come out of other promise. Yeah. This piece of code. Okay. Is it is it just just well kind of contract that it, it's it's not going to be or you can annotate the code on top that it's not promisable? Uh no you. Uh, you don't need to annotate the code, so data grok autom automatically gets that you want to use promises and you want to use awaits. Huh. Um, just a quick question about the IntelliSense. So, how generic this IntelliSense is? Is it only for data grok? Um, namespaces, so to say, or? Uh, yeah, right now uh, it works only uh, for data grok because uh, we can't uh, get to the classes. Uh, so we need to compile and run the script to, um, uh, to get the fields for variables, for example. But with TypeScript, I think we could, uh, uh, we could use TypeScript uh, language and uh, TypeScript abilities to get this uh, feature for basically all variables. It's not. It's not uh, there right uh, right now. But yeah, this is our intention. Uh, yes, thank you, Alexander. Um, <laughs> yeah, not to be asking too much, but I think the next big thing would be to have the uh, argument. Uh, function arguments uh, highlight. Uh, yeah, 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 I understand what you're talking about. We already have uh, this support in uh, uh, IDE. So IDE already understands all, all, all the data grok API, uh, already understands the TypeScript, and it's highly recommend to write uh, new packages on TypeScript and convert old, packa old packages to TypeScript too. too. But yeah, it's not there uh, in data grok because there are a lot, a lot of things to, to do to support this. Okay, good, Alexander. Thank you a lot for the presentation. And uh, we are approaching the end of the meeting. Um, so please, any last questions you may have? Okay, then uh, I pass the host to Andrew. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, Alexander. I think we have uh, 30 seconds uh, left. So I just want to thank uh, everyone for uh, attending uh, our user group. Uh, as you know, we have uh, moved uh, the schedule so that we now meet every uh, three months. So we will send the agenda in advance, but we are planning uh, next time to present uh, uh, our work on bioinformatics and clinical data analysis. But again, we will be uh, sending the announcement uh, in advance. So uh, thanks everyone again. Uh, have a great day and a good weekend. Thank you all and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.